I'm Kate Chaplinsky for the HAN Network, and February is National Eating Disorder Awareness Month. And we're at Silver Hill Hospital in New Canaan talking with experts about a number of pertinent topics around eating disorders and treatment. And I'm joined today by Dr. Aaron Clyfield, who's the director of the Eating Disorders Program here at Silver Hill. Doctor, so happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Now, let's talk first about the importance of early intervention. Why mm. is it so important? Mm. Very good question. So. Let me start by saying that there is an increasing literature, treatment outcome data, on the importance of early intervention. There's treatment outcomes showing that when eating disorders are treated within the first three years of onset of the eating disorder, that the outcome is much stronger, that uh, the rate of recovery is stronger, the maintenance of the success is longer, so the prognosis change, changes greatly when we intervene early on. In contrast, um, when eating disorders are left and go untreated, they become a lot more intractable. And if we think about it as sort of brain chemistry, mm -hmm. the longer habit patterns go on, the more entrenched it becomes in the neural pathways. I like to think of it as a marble going down a hill. And the longer, the more it goes down that hill, the more entrenched that groove becomes, the more ingrained the habit patterns become, both behaviorally as well as the neurochemical. And beliefs become more fixed and more entrenched over time. And also eating disorders, unlike other psychiatric problems, have medical consequences. And those medical consequences become more severe over time. So the longer it goes untreated, the medical complications get worse. The malnourishment and the effects on the brain get stronger, and the habit patterns become more fixed and entrenched. Um, the other thing to, to keep in mind is that eating disorders are 12 times, they're associated with the greatest mortality. They're 12 times more likely than average to be associated with uh, death, and amongst adolescents, uh, it is the third most chronic disorder. So um, these go on and on. If, if untreated, they will um, persist. Very virulent disorders. Wow. So what can family and friends do to be proactive with a loved one that they suspect has an eating disorder? So, you know, uh, given that um, for many people, an eating disorder is what we call egosyntonic, it serves a purpose for them. It has an adaptive function, so they don't want to give it up. So family members uh, need to really stay the course with people. They need to not back down. Um, people will often deny they have it. They'll try to conceal it. Uh, they won't necessarily be you know, upfront and, and you know, they'll be very resistant to receiving help, which is quite a challenge for family members. So I would say that they, it would help for them to be educated, to do some reading, to understand what they're up against, and to really push for treatment, to not let the denial and the anger, uh, and, and also they will minimize and, and you know, make excuses in a way, um, at justifications, I'm not hungry, all kinds of things to not buy into those. You know, stay proactive by getting treatment, seeking out the help of professionals. This is not an easy disease. And even when people are motivated and willing, it's still a tough battle. So when you've got the resistance in the beginning, don't go it alone. Get the support. There's uh, websites and literature. There's so much information out there now. Avail yourself of the information and, and continue to intervene and don't back down. Now, you mentioned adolescents earlier. Is that when we're seeing a lot of these eating disorders start? Absolutely. It's the highest uh, time for eating disorders to emerge. You know, if you think about it, I mean, it's when the body is going through so many changes and identity and social pressures and you know, people in adolescence are trying to uh, figure out who they are and they're under so much pressure to perform. A lot of the people with eating disorders are very perfectionistic, they're high achieving, very hard on themselves. And so when they have all those demands going on and are very hard on themselves, you know, they look often to body image as a way of defining themselves. And so they look to that as the way to elevate self-esteem, to be approved of by peers. You know, peer approval is so significant at that time. Um, and you know, oftentimes dieting and body image, it, it spreads like a contagion, like wildfire. So people are very susceptible. It's a very vulnerable age, both emotionally, 
with identity and biologically, all kinds of hormonal changes and physical changes. It's also when the body is uh, increasing in, in adipose and fat stores. Many adolescents will say, I feel like I was betrayed by my body mm -hmm. at a time when body image is more important to them than ever. And now let's talk about screenings and education. Mm -hmm. How can those lead to early intervention? Well, again, you know, uh, because people will c try to conceal and hide, it really helps when people are aware of the signs and symptoms, when they're aware of what, you know, what to be looking for. If a person leaves the dinner table every night, goes to the bathroom and comes back with bloodshot eyes, if every morning they're saying, oh, I'm really not hungry, and you know, they start to restrict carbohydrates at every meal. I mean, all the little, little signs mm -hmm. and be, uh, you know, uh, the more that people are aware of those signs, the more they can intervene and not take no for an answer so readily. Um, so these kinds of things can help, again, with early intervention. Not be put off, not just think this is just, uh, you know, an adolescent uh, phase they're going through, but to really take it seriously. Now let's talk a little bit about stigma. We are seeing, you know, mental health, addiction. The stigmas change a bit. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to eating disorders, something that affects the way somebody looks, is there still stigma around oh, that? Very much so. And many myths and misconceptions, like, you know, it's, it's about vanity or, mm -hmm. you know, if she really wanted to, she could, that it's a willful act. Eating disorders are not a choice. It is not the person's fault. And, you know, we often also are thinking about eating disorders as brain disorders because once there's a certain sequelae of consequences from malnourishment, it's almost as though the person has no choice. They become increasingly compulsive, increasingly obsessed. And uh, so they really are fighting against themselves. They, even in when they really want it and they know what they're losing and missing out on in life, it's still a huge challenge. So there are many myths and misconceptions where they are being blamed for their own struggle. And so, um, you know, also keeping in mind how shame-based it is. People, as much as it's what we call egocentric that they want it, they are also very ashamed of their behaviors at the same time. So um, the more that we as a society understand what these people are going through, the pain they're in, the emotional suffering, the more we can help them rather than blame them and judge them, which will only help lead for them to feel more ashamed and want to hide and conceal and lie about what they're going through. And then we can't help them. Dr. Clyfield, this has been an amazing discussion. So much good information. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for being here. All right. And if you want to find out more about our month-long partnership with Silver Hill Hospital, visit our website, han.network.